perspective of the world is true. And so Martin invited uh, five contemporary artists to envision emptiness, and you can go and see it after this session on the fourth floor. It's, it's, it's really, really a great show. We're very, very proud of it. Um, but we thought as a counterpoint, we should on this stage present what nothingness means, and it doesn't mean emptiness, because we had a um, Tibetan Lama on stage yesterday with Bill Viola, and he gave us a wonderful textbook explanation of the difference between emptiness and nothingness. However, nothing appears so often in our vocabulary, and particularly in Shakespeare, that um, we thought it would be great to have one of the truly greatest Shakespearean interpreters, Brian Cox, on stage with us um, to explore what nothing in Shakespeare means and what character means if you can develop out of nothing. Um, nothing will come of nothing, says King Lear. Well, we will find later on, possibly with Richard Panic here in the audience uh, uh, on stage and, and Lisa Randall and Christopher Potter, that in fact, the universe did actually come out of nothing, but that's, that's for another week. Um, delighted to welcome Alison Gopnik here. Um, she is professor of psychology at the University of Calif uh, California, Berkeley, and um, it's a rare appearance to have her here in New York. So thank you for making the trip out, Alison. It's a really delight to have you here. Um, and Alison is, of course, the author of a number of books, and uh, most recently, The Philosophical Baby, which um, is on sale upstairs. And as you can see um, from the interaction of Brian Cox and young Theo, um, they, I think, might have an awful lot in common to talk about. So please welcome uh, Mr. Brian Cox and uh, Dr. Alison Gopnik to the stage. Thank you. off from that clip, which one of the great things about developmental psychology is that you get to be cute and profound at the same time. Yeah. And I think that's a very good example of a cute and profound clip, uh, especially for actors, because really what developmental psychology tells us, that aside from that particularly adorable child, what that child is doing is what all children do to construct a sense of self for themselves, which is sort of be like actors going out and saying, here's the tone of voice, here's the intonation, here's the gesture and then internalizing that. And we know that literally from the time that babies are born, um, newborn babies are already imitating what it is that we do and using that to construct a self for themselves. So what do you think about actors being like two-year-olds and two-year-olds being like actors? I, I actually think that uh, it's the other way around. I think um, this is what we've lost. Hmm. And this is what actors try to recreate. This to me is what the essence of acting is about. Acting is about a blank page. It's about the state of nothingness. And it's on top of that state of nothingness that things become projected. And therefore, you start getting impressions. You start creating uh, a character, a person. And I think that's the principle of acting. I think that we've, the whole Stanislavski and Strasbourgian principle of acting, I think is an extremely confusing thing where you can carry to, you know, you, you, I've worked with actors who carry their characters with them daily on an everyday basis. And it actually is anti what acting, I think, is about. Mm -hmm. What Theo shows absolutely brilliantly in that clip is how you can just suggest a gesture. And he will take the gesture and take it that much further and make it his own. It's totally who he is. And it's, actually, it's not just who he is, it's who he's finding himself to That's be. That's right. Really. And I think that that is the fundamental principle of acting. And I've only come to this conclusion as I've got older and older and older. And I realized that, you know, because we carry so much characters around in our psyche, that they are like, they are like little, uh, you know, they're, they're, they are little sort of, they're creatures in themselves. I was fascinated because another thing, I was reading this thing called Quantum Healing, which you could probably tell me about, which is about, it was about a child um, who had multiple personalities. <coughs> And it was very interesting that this child with its multiple personality and one personality had an allergy to orange juice. And yet in the other personality, when they did the blood work, there was no, <laughs> there was none. So that it seems to me that the cell, the human cell is completely almost like nothing. 
It's something that something can be projected upon, that information can be stored in. And uh, you, you'll know from your work that the, the thing about children is that they're constantly going through the development of personality right. and throwing personality away and deciding what suits them. And, and we're constantly struggling with them uh, because of the parts of their personality we don't, we don't want them to have that they are adopting. Well, you know, I think this is one of the places where developmental psychology speaks to philosophy because there's been a long philosophical argument for many, many years from Descartes who thought that the self was the one thing that was absolutely fixed and that we knew about. So, you know, the cogito ergo sum is about. So I think, therefore, I am, mm. I know about myself, if nothing else. And then other philosophers, like David Hume and like the Buddhist scholars, who actually may even have influenced Hume, um, argue, wait a minute, no, actually, if you look inside of your head, what is this self that you keep talking about? That what it is is something that's an invention, a construction. And what the science, it could have come out either way, but what the science and what the developmental science tells us is that that sort of Humean, Buddhist view seems to be much closer to what we actually see with children. And we are starting to understand some of the processes, and they include some of the basic processes that we see in acting. So things like um, creating imaginary companions mm. or becoming an imaginary right. companion, which is one of the things that we see children doing Absolutely. completely spontaneously without the incentive of fame and a salary. Um, is one of the ways that the children actually and seem to create And not only without the world. incentive of fame and a salary, but with no preparation. Yeah. You know, with absolutely no preparation. You know, they don't research. Children don't research their roles. They, pre they precisely are their roles. And that, to me, is the beauty of child children you know, and, and, and children performing. Because they don't, they don't, have, any, they don't have any truck with it. You know, yeah. I mean, I had, a, I had a, a wonderful teacher of mine called Michael McCohen many, many years ago. When I was, and he was teaching a thing called Stanislavski and Onwards. And he talked about a three-year-old child when a three-year-old child pretends to be a train. Right. And it goes choo 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 It is that train. It doesn't have any question about it. There's no argument about it. There's no discussion. There's no kind of ethical thing. Should I be a train? Should I not be a train? <laughs> and uh, there's so much cant has grown up about my profession that I can't stand it. <laughs> and particularly in this country. In this country. They've sort of hijacked certain things which, uh, to me, are kind of anti-acting. Because actually, uh, any great actor has to spin on a dime. Mm. He has to be able, she has to be able to change, to do a 360 degree switch, which children do effortlessly. Yes, completely spontaneously. And it's always been, it's been sort of a mystery in developmental psychology about why is it that children would spend so much time, and again, not just gifted or creative children, all children, every three-year-old, walk into any daycare and you'll see, you know, there are princesses pouring out tea and there are ninjas who are doing amazing feats. And this is just part of childhood. And it's always been kind of mysterious to psychologists because why, even from an evolutionary point of view, would you spend so many of your early years off in these completely insane worlds? And the, the view that people like Freud and Piaget both had was that it was because children couldn't tell the difference between uh, fantasy and reality, but that turns out not to be true no, at all, any more than actors can't tell the difference. Right. The well, children they can sometimes, they get a little bit confused. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, the children understand the difference between the real world and the fantasy world perfectly well. They just don't see any reason why you should live in the real world instead of uh, the fantasy world. And it, it turns out that that ability to do things like pretend or to have an imaginary companion is very connected with children's ability to understand how both they and other people around them work. So it's as if this exercise of what would it be like to be, uh, what would it be like to be Superman? What would it be like to be the princess? That exercise is part of what we all have to do to figure out the, the truth about ourselves and others. And that's partly because in a, in a way there isn't a truth to find out about. It's a truth we have to create. Alison, given that, do you, do you think that children also have a sense of what nothing is? Mm. Well, I think when it comes to the self in particular, I think we have a lot of evidence that children only very gradually construct an idea of the self the way we have it as adults. So our idea of the self, for instance, as being the person who is going to be there tomorrow and the person for whom I'm doing something in the future. You think about it, it's very mystifying. I mean, why is it that I'm actually willing to deprive myself of money now for that other person who's going to be around in, in 30 years, right? And, you know, I think about this sometimes when I think about when I have papers to write or something like that, I find myself 
saying, well, it's perfectly okay if she does this a year from now, because first of all, she has nothing to do a year from now. And secondly, if she complains about it, I'm gonna be gone, right? <laughs> um, now, why is it that we don't always just discount our future selves? As adults, we seem to be quite willing to treat our future and our past as if we're all just one continuous process. Right. And I think we actually have good empirical evidence, good data from experiment, that the three-year-olds don't do that. That the three-year-old, the self now has many more possibilities, and it's not constrained by, here's what my history was, and here's where I'm heading in the future. And I think, I think actors may have, well, I mean, I can ask you, you know, the old question about, does the actor, is there a self that's separate from all the parts that the actor is? Well, is yeah, well there's a sort of, yeah, I mean, there's a kind of, um, I mean, there's essence in personality, you know, and, and, and I think the thing that as an actor you try and sort out is, especially when you're dealing with, um, I mean, my, 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 my thing is always the viewpoint, the, the fact that everybody has a viewpoint, everybody has a point of view. Even Adolf Hitler had a point of view, and if you play Adolf Hitler from his point of view, it's an empathetic thing, it's not a sympathetic thing, but it's, it's, it's the fact that you have to really go to what that viewpoint was. And therefore you, and I tend to play a lot of bad guys. <laughs> Uh, and at one time in my life, I actually kind of resented the fact I was playing bad guys. In fact, I found it a little bit of a, bur I mean, I, you know, and, I, and, it was a, and somebody one time said, and I'd already played it, said, well, why don't you now, you'll be a great, and I was going through a bad period, and they said, now Macbeth would be a great one. I said, no, 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 no. Macbeth would be a horrible role for me to play at this particular point. But then I realized that actually, there's a kind of privilege in playing bad guys because you do try to understand where they're coming from. Right. And you do understand that they have, they have their own inner child, as it were. They have their own little person that they carry around with them that hasn't developed or has developed or has been forced to do certain things that it shouldn't have done far too early, you know. And certainly in my own life, uh, I, I can recognize that quite strongly. Uh, and, and there was another thing, too, which, which came to me just recently, actually. They were talking about, you know, because... I have, we have children, my wife and I, we have children of our own, and they're, you know, they're this combination of anarchy mm -hmm. and conservatism. Right. And so you're always dealing with this kind of switching between the two, and you never, and you can't keep up with them, right. because they'll, they'll, they'll take you down one conservative road, and then suddenly hit you with a mass of anarchy. <laughs> and you're thinking, oh, I see, I've got to be anarchic, and then suddenly <laughs> they'll go all conservative on you. And so they're always second-guessing you, and then, and I had a, I, was, I had an interesting program in England about, and it was a hostage negotiator, hmm. a very successful hostage negotiator. And he was, he was talking about how he, you deal with hostages and how when you go into a hostage negotiation, you have to really understand the other point of view. Hmm. It's very important so that you don't do damage. And then he talked about children. And he came up with this phrase, and because we were doing this program, it just struck me, that children have nothing. So they've got, no, they've got no counters uh -huh. with which they can play with. So you, in, in relationship to them, you have to give them counters so that they can then play with you. Could then, they can then do deals with you in order, if you do this, I'll do that. And it's a form of blackmail, but it's also, it is negotiation. But, for, but the thing is that actually, at root, they have nothing to negotiate with. Right. Although it's interesting because uh, thinking about nothing in terms of our, uh, what we know about children as well, one of the other great puzzles is, why do we have children at all, right? Why do we have this long, <laughs> I mean, there's the obvious reason, but why is it that once we bring them into the world, we put so much investment and time and energy, energy into them? Because after all, if you think about it, you know, on the surface, they're useless. And not only they're useless, but they're sort of worse than useless because they require so much investment from us. And it turns out that if you look across species, across evolution, there's a correlation between how flexible and creative and intelligent the adult animal is and how long a period of helpless immaturity they have. So crows, for example, are you know, these incredibly in intelligent, clever birds, and they are, have, are fledglings for a year and a half. And human beings have a much longer period of immaturity than any other creature, including our primate relatives. And the, the theory is that what happens is if you have a period when you don't actually have to do anything, when you're not obliged to actually be a real person out there in the world accomplishing things, that's when you can explore possibility. That's when you can actually imagine all the different ways that you could be as a human being, all mm. the different things that you could be, and particularly in social settings, all the different human beings that you could be. Once you've, 
once you're committed, I mean, once you've got something, as it were, at stake, once you've got something that to gain from being one person versus another person, it gets to be much harder to have that flexibility. And yet, the thing that makes us as a species so powerful and successful is exactly the fact that we can say, let's imagine a different way for us to be. Mm -hmm. Let's imagine a different world. Let's mm -hmm. imagine a different way of actually being, uh, of actually being in that world. And so there's a sense in which quite literally what evolution does is give us this period of play. And I think it's no coincidence that plays are play. That mm -hmm. what we do it's with play, play is, I think it's absolutely is be a player. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think play is, I, I love the word play. I, I, I think it is play. I mean, that's, it seems to me that, you know, that when I was a child, the thing that made me link with the sense of being an actor was the sense of play. And it goes right back to them and us, that situation, th those games, especially in Scotland, where you couldn't go out because it was too cold. <laughs> so you tended to play in one room, but you created a world out there and a world that you were actually sort of observing and copying and mimicking. And, it, it was, uh, and I remember play very vividly. And play seemed to me a kind of logical, I mean, acting seemed a very much a logical extension right. of being the pl the baby player. I mean, I, I, that's why, for me, I can't honestly remember a time when I never wanted to be an actor. Uh -huh. If I was absolutely truthful, it seemed to me a complete natural evolution into that job. And I and in that way, I feel very blessed. You know, I mean, I I think it has its drawbacks, and I think it certainly has its. Um, which is just something I wanted to pick up on that you said, though, which is, you know, the, the whole, you know, one of our problems that you know one of the problems. That uh, that my wife and I have is our children being f forced too quickly nowadays. Are there are they are they being asked to evolve too quickly? Right. Well, I think we have lots of reason to think that that's true. So, if you have this kind of evolutionary picture in which you've got this period of exploration, which isn't you know just there because it's wonderful to explore, but also because in the end that's how you manage to be a flexible. Uh, creative adult, right. then I think there, I think there is a reason. I mean, even if you look at children's brains as they develop, the executive, the prefrontal part, that the sort of chief executive office of the brain, we know develops much later than any other part. And often, what you see uh, parents and other adults saying is, "Oh, we need to get that in there faster. We need to get those that kind of yeah. planning and focus and narrowness in there faster." And there's a reason why it's not there from the beginning which is that there seems to be this kind of intrinsic trade-off. Computer scientists who we work with talk about this is the difference between exploring and exploiting. And sometimes you really want to exploit. You want to say, okay, this is the right answer and I'm just going to go out and do it. But the great human ability is that we go back and forth from exploring and saying, all right, that looks like the right answer, but here's this insane, crazy idea here about well, what we could be like. We well, could it's be also, but it's also the process of gathering the information, isn't it? It's also the process of making, especially in a child, making those decisions. You know, those little imprints that they get, those impressions that they get, and deciding that impression doesn't really work. Right. It worked, it sustained me for that length of time, but now I have to move into another impression. There's another impression that I'm, I'm looking for. So there's a sort of push-me-pull you situation going on with children constantly. Well, and, and you mentioned something which I think is really crucial to this, which is perspective change. So, you know, one of the things about human beings is we're this incredibly social species. And because we're both a social species and a creative species, we're always recreating what it means to be human. And for, again, literally from the time they're born, babies are doing things like picking up on gestures and emotional expressions. And mm -hmm. we know that there's very close ties between gestures and facial expressions and the way that things feel inside. So from the time they're born, babies seem to have this kind of intrinsic empathy, this intrinsic ability, just, just like Fib, yeah. to take on, all right, here's the gesture, and when you take on the gesture, you also take on the, here's the internal feeling. That's right. From the, from the I family. think that's very clear when, he, when, when Theo says, uh, y you know, oh God, I can't remember the line, when he says, uh, <laughs> to be or not to be, that is the question, whether there's no one to be or not, that is the question. And he that is the, the question. question right. When he, we did the gesture, he kind of took the gesture even further. Having, having acknowledged in his, I love the way he says, yes, it is. <laughs> he keeps saying, he gets to the point much quicker than we do. You know? It is, it is. 
Yes, <laughs> I've, I've done that. Now I'm <laughs> going over here. Have you seen my, <laughs> uh, there's a bit, wonderful bit at the end. He says, have you seen my other, my, my what is it? He says, some, my hobby horses or something. Because <laughs> he he's, they have this ability to go boom, 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 boom. And from an actor's point of view, it's absolutely fascinating to observe children in that way. Because it, it, it feeds you, because you realize what you've got to live up to right. in terms of, of the craft. Really, that you have to know how to shift something. And, uh, you know, when you have a problem on a stage where you're, you're bogged down in a kind of, usually it's an ego problem hmm. that a, an actor may have of, of, of not negotiating a particular moment, wanting to avoid the moment. Whereas a child just takes the moment and goes through it, doesn't have any, has got no kind of, there's no perspective on it. Mm -hmm. And constantly as an actor is you have to lose perspective in a way in order to experience something else, or, or, or order to allow the audience to experience is actually what you're doing. Well, I mean, in a way, you could argue that what Shakespeare is doing with you is the same thing that you're doing with Theo, where he's giving you, you know, he's not telling you this is, no. this is, the, psychoanal this is the psychological analysis of, of Hamlet. What he's doing is saying, here's a bunch of words, and here's a bunch of gestures and emotions that go with these words, and through this process of taking the words and the gestures, I'm going to teach you right. about something very, uh, about right. a, a way of being in the world, a kind of person That's right. that you've probably never seen before That's or right. never experienced or never known. And not only am I going to teach you about the fact that there's a Hamlet that's out there in the world, but you're going to feel that, I mean, literally yeah. feel that Hamlet as a result of doing those gestures. And in a way, that's what every single child, um, when they're you know, two years old, is doing, is looking around at the people around them and saying, oh, that's what those people are like. That's and right. Here's what it feels like to be, here's what it feels like to be that person. Yeah, it, it's just, a w it, it's such a responsibility. I mean, that's the thing. I mean the whole parenting thing, you know, the, the, you, I mean, I've been an early parent and a late parent, and I'm still as bad as I was when I was an early <laughs> parent. I mean, I still have the lack of, and it's, and it's, well, you're constantly being challenged by children because they're constantly, you know, and you're seeing bits of yourself in them that you realize, I wish they didn't have that <laughs> bit of them in there. I really wish that I, I hadn't, they hadn't got that imprint. And you think, how do I take that imprint out of them? How do I remove that? And said, you know, that was a mistake. You shouldn't have picked up that bit. Now that bit's a good <laughs> bit, you know. It's like a rehearsal. Let's let's have a rehearsal, right. children. Let's go through and we'll just we'll rehearse our life together. You know, we, we you know, and you'll you you play you take this text because this is really a good text. Right. You don't want that text. That's a bad text. You don't want that text one out. And, and in a way, maybe that's how one should conduct one's <laughs> parenting is, I mean, is do a series of like rehearsals. Well, I mean, I think you could make a good argument that exactly. In fact, the, the, uh, the book that I'm working on now, in, in The Philosophical Baby, I had a whole section about imagination and play and how children's imagination uh, plays into the same kinds of things that adult literature and theater and so forth play into. In the new book, I'm going to be, I've been thinking about talking about what it means to be a parent. And I think maybe a nice analogy is to think about when you have the director who is absolutely convinced that he knows what the performance should be like and <laughs> is... I've worked with those. Right, I mean, that, <laughs> yeah, that doesn't work. What no, it doesn't. What comes out of that is a person. But it if doesn't. you think of that, the kind of collaboration where you say, all right, here's the child, they have a sense of the creature that they're going to be, and mm. you can't tell them what it is that they're going to be, but you can, you can say, let's try it out this way, or wait a minute, now I've seen the way that you do that, let's try something else. And what comes out of that is exactly the evolutionary point of having children, which is a new person. And in the same way that, you know, in a, in a play, what comes out of the director and the actor working together is, uh, the director and the actor and the writer coming together is, you know, there's sort of a new Hamlet or new Lear right. every time. Well, and, and, and it is the convocation of those all those characters that create that event, you know. Uh, and there's no getting around that. I mean, I used to have, I uh, uh, worked with a wonderful director who's no longer with us, who said, you know, when you start rehearsing on day one and you've got 28 days, you know on day 28 you're gonna open. So in a way, no matter what you did, it's already set down, it's already, <laughs> it's already right. there. There will be a performance in 28 days, it will happen. And it will happen, you know, all being well with that particular group of people. So in a sense, it's allowing that trust 
of invention, of understanding, of realizing how each day goes by, having bad days, having good days, allowing that to happen. And also, I suppose it is the same trust with children, you right. know, that you have to have the same trust with a child, that you look at a child and you think, how is he ever going to get through this? How is he ever going to make it to that point? And, uh, and I think my wife and I will would be the first to agree that we, we, we've been seeing miracles with our children recently because of things that we were kind of overwhelmed by. And now you understand as a process, you know, as... Uh, well, think you know, about, you know, think about instead of thinking of it as opening in 28 days, think of it as opening in 21 years, yeah, right? Exactly. Um, the opening is going to be there. It's going to, you know, that's, they're that's going to be... That's a very good point. They're going to be 20, and that's whatever it is that, that opens is going to be the and thing it, that And opens. are we under pressure? Maybe we are under pressure to open in 28 days rather than 21 years. Yeah. Maybe that's one of the pressures with our children is, you know, because I, I suddenly think that sometimes they're not allowed to be children. You know, we, 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 not that we, we want them to be children, but children with a certain expectation, not children to be just children, you know. And also the difference between male children and female children. I mean, there's, I mean, uh, the <laughs> there's a wonderful comedian who talks about the difference between men and women, and it talks about men have this thing called the nothing box, you know, whereas they're, they're sitting there and the women say, well, what are you thinking about? And you say, nothing. <laughs> And you actually are thinking about nothing. <laughs> but a woman would never accept that. You know, that, I oh know there's something going on. You say, no, 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 it's nothing. I'm in a state of nothing. And I think I see that with my sons. You know, right. that they are actually sitting there and I can see them like little, in little mini no nothing boxes where nothing is actually going on. But with a little girl, everything's going on. You know, there's so much going on. There's so much activity. There's so, and especially, you know, with their mom, you know, you can see that magnified. But they sit there like this. <laughs> and nothing's happening, you know. And it's trusting that nothing to happen and going, well, that's part of being a boy. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think that the whole question about what the relationship is between the, the external things that you do and then the sense of the internal dialogue, the thing that's going on inside of your head. And mm -hmm. I think we actually have good, again, we have good evidence that part of what happens with children is that in, in, there's wonderful studies by a developmental psychologist called James John Slavel exactly about asking children, you know, sort of what's going on in your head when you're not doing anything. And there's a very clear developmental progression where early on they just say, well, nothing. And then they get to the point where they say, oh, I see, there's a void, or there's a bunch of pictures that are going on that's in my right. head. But that's actually a creation. That isn't that's something right. that you just take for granted. That's, that's right. the way that you develop, uh, you develop things. That's the process. Um, yeah. There's a beautiful uh, Zimborska poem called uh, Rehearsal, which is about life being that you just get, you just have to go on, right? And you just keep going on. You don't get to do it over no, again. No. You, it's, it's, it's not till. 21 years when you go on stage, but you're going on stage every well, no, single it's, day. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's the performance. I mean, it's the, pro the problem that actors have, you know, a lot of actors have is because they, because they deal with this material. It, it can be a little overwhelming sometimes because mm. of just, not n n the discipline of it is one thing, but the fact that you have, you keep thinking, you know, it's like, why can't I get that right when on stage I can do it brilliantly? Yeah. On stage, I am fantastic. I can do that. I can solve, you know, I can solve quantum theory. I can do anything on stage. That this, I'm this is the old uh, Cary you know, Grant thing. Everybody wants to be Cary Grant, that's including right. me, you, right? You, you, you can do it. But when it comes to you getting up in the morning and actually putting on your clothes or, or preparing your day, mm -hmm. the gap is so enormous. And yet, there's a sort of, there's something that happens in the state of play that happens in why, you know, why that's liberating about a rehearsal process, because you, 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 it, it, there's a sanction that goes on, yeah. which is the sanction like the sanction that very, very young children exactly. have, the sanction that Theo has in his playing, in his way that he can move through something towards something else, come back to it, you know, discard it, re-examine it, discard it again. Now, we as adults are not quite allowed to do that. Mm -hmm. We're not quite allowed to... We, uh, but we've never found the substitute for it. Right. You know? I suppose that's why the theater and cinema and it does appeal to me, because it's as near as you can get to that, that recreating of something else. And it's, it's very privileged in that way. But it's, 
you know, you, you know, I can pretend to be something better than I can be it. Yeah. You know. <laughs> well, this is, I think this is part of this explore, explore uh, picture. So my first book is called The Scientist in the Crib. And one of the things that I and other psychologists have argued is that if you look at science, science is doing some of the same things, the kind of exploration of the physical world that yeah. children do very spontaneously. Absolutely. Is something that we get to do when we're scientists. And when you're talking about the kind of being sanctioned, it's the same thing. If you're a scientist in a lab exploring, say, the physical causal nature of the world, you're allowed to try out possibilities in a way that, you know, so one of the one of my one of the things I say is children are like the research and development division of the human species, and we're production and marketing. Right. Um, we're the ones who actually have to take their discoveries, which they're allowed to do in a very blue sky kind of way, and put them to use to actually get things done. Right. And in a way, you could think about acting and theater as being the sort of research and development division of human psychology, right? right? It's the place where we're allowed to, uh, we don't have to worry about you know selling what the product is going to be. We're allowed to say, here's the, possibilities, and they could include possibilities of tragedy, for example, right. right? I mean, here's a way of being in the world that's going to end up terribly badly, and yet you can play through what it would be like to end up terribly badly. Mm -hmm. And when you're actually, you know, in the adult, in the sort of exploit phase of adulthood, you can't quite have the luxury of saying, well, let me try out the possibility that ends out terribly badly in tragedy. No, right? you can't. I mean, you have to actually try to do the thing in the real world and in your real constraints that will end up that will that will end up well. But the the what the what the uh, cognitive science tells us it's is it's for human beings especially it's the possibility it's the ability to envision here's the one that would end up this particular way that lets us get to places where we can have you know democracy or we can have. Uh, women who are scientists. We can have all sorts of ways of actually mm -hmm. being, or we can have actors who are respected fellows instead of being crazy shaman That's or, right. or uh, uh, wanderers. Well, it's also, it's also, it does come down to the connection between, you, you mentioned between science and art. I mean, I've, I've recently spent some time at, in my hometown of Dundee, and I spent a lot of time in a science lab because I'm a spokesperson for the College of Life Sciences there, yeah. and they're doing the most extraordinary work on tropical disease. And it's very interesting when you go into, you, when you talk to these scientists, because it's, it is like going into a nursery. Mm -hmm. It's because they, they, are, they are all licensed yeah. to behave in any way that they want to behave because, because of what their toys are. Right. You know, their toys are these are, are test tubes and, and, and 3D images on computers, dry labs and wet labs. And they play with these toys to the hilt. And they love the, and they have this childlike joy about what they do. And so it's not all that far from, from the act of imagination because it's actually, it's actually part of the act of imagination. Right. It's spurred on by that. And it kind of, and, and, and it's, 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 it's becomes more fabric. It has more fabric to it. But it's really interesting that you know, how, how their world and their community actually gives them the sanction to create and gives them sanction to discover and break new barriers and everything. But the actual principle of the world is very much like the principle of the nursery. Right. Or even the principle of the rehearsal room. Of the rehearsal, yeah, exactly. It's, exactly. it's the same principle at work. And therefore, there is, you find, when you go into other disciplines, you find that there's really very little that separates you. Right. Only the toys that separate right. you. Right. But the impulse is exactly the same. Well, I think, I think the idea that what's happening in play in the nursery, what's happening in rehearsal, what's happening in the lab, all those are part of this same set of human capacities. And it's interesting that even if you think about the most absolutely you know, obvious physical things, think about this room, right? So everything in this room, those right angles and the bottles and the woven fabric, everything in this room started out as something imaginary. Right. From the perspective of the Pleistocene, Absolutely. every single thing in this room, not to mention the people in it, were didn't exist. That all started out as a kind of crazy imaginative possibility. So I think well they started the off from nothing. Yeah, they, exactly. <laughs> so the, the, we start off. Part of what it means to be human is that we start off with nothing except possibility. Okay. Um, and one of the things that I think is really important is that often when people are talking about science and art, they act as if 
there's a kind of tension between finding out the truth or being a scientist or being an artist or being creative or being imaginative. And one of the things that I think we've worked out even is you know, some detail about how our brains and uh, the computers inside of our heads are doing this is to understand the world means understanding what philosophers call counterfactuals, which is understanding what the world is like means understanding all the other possible ways the world could be. And that's another way of thinking about a way that nothing ends up actually being being everything, right? Mm -hmm. That it's because you can imagine all the possibilities, all the different ways that the world could be, all the different ways that you could be. That's the, that's the way that we actually mm -hmm. can manage to end up with, uh, with the things that human beings do. That's, and, and you know, uh, other animals do this to some extent, but certainly we people, human beings, do this to an extent that's much greater than anyone else. Mm -hmm. And as I say, one of the things we really do is create human beings, and mm -hmm. I think a lot of what a lot of what happens in theater is the chance to actually create human beings in this very sort of physical, um, physical, visceral way. It's funny, when Leo says nothing will come of nothing, uh, he's not quite accurate mm -hmm. because it's not quite true. Uh, you know, something usually comes of nothing. Right. And, and it's, it's, and it's, and, uh, and funny enough, he, that there is a kind of throughout the play, there is this playing with the idea of nothing. In fact, the fool at one point challenges Leo, and he says, uh, let's quote here, he says, um, I think I'll find the quote. Um, yeah, he says, uh, he says, oh yeah, he says, Leo says, um, truth's a dog, the, the, the fool says, truth's a dog, must a kennel, he must be whipped out when the lady brash may stand by the fire and stink, a pestilent god to me. He says, sir, I'll, ste I'll teach you a speech. Says the fool to Leah. Mark it, uncle. Have more than thou showest, speak less than thou knowest, lend less than thou owest, ride more than thou goest, <laughs> lend more than thou trowest, set less than thou throwest, leave thy drink and thy whore, and keep in a door, and thou shalt have more than two tens to a score. <laughs> and then Leah says, This is nothing, fool. <laughs> And he said, then it is the like the breath of an unfeed lawyer, my, you give me nothing for it. And he says, can you make use of nothing, uncle? <coughs> Why no, boy? Nothing can be made out of nothing. Mm. But of course, the whole point is going to be, and, and, and in a way, if you think about what happens to Lear, and what happens to Lear in the storm, is that all the, all the very um, coherent sense of self that he has, and after all, he's the powerful king, right? Mm. I mean, you know, if you talk about exploit, he's the, the ultimate executive in his, in his life. He's the one who's, he's the front lobe. He's the one who can do all the planning and make things happen. Mm -hmm. And exactly what happens is that all that disappears. He That's loses right. all and of he that. He has to strip it all away. And what he ends up being is being like a child. Yeah. He's, and even, it, you know, if you hear the fool's language, a lot of the fool's language is sort of nursery rhymes. Absolutely, and, it, and, it, and it, it's that kind of awakening. And when he meets his daughter again, it's very much little like conspiratorial children. Right. It's a fantastic scene in the play. I mean, in the, the one way that you could think about that is even, you know, this incredibly powerful old uh, man who seems to have his entire life shaped, when he gets to the point where there isn't any of that left, that's when he can actually start exploring and figuring out who he actually is beyond the power and the role. Well, what he, d what he does is he tries to give everything away, but he does give everything away, but he, tr he does it with strings attached, mm. which is the idea of giving everything away is a fantastic idea. You know, and the fact that he's divesting himself and stripping himself away to nothing, to nothing, right. to nothing. But then he says, if you love me, I'll give you that more. Right. And he's asking for love. He's not asking for something which is tangible. He's asking, and actually the truth of the matter is, he's got to negate everything. Mm -hmm. You can't get love. You just have to say, you just have to give it away. If you're going to give it away, just give it away. And that's the thing that Leah, that's his tragedy in a way, that he, he, he's not able to give it away without something that he, you know, when he goes around to the daughters, they say, you're, you know, you're supposed to take care of me. You're, you're, you're now, I'm, I'm your charge. And they go, no, 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 we've, you know, we've got rid of you. And, and he goes mad because suddenly he's left abandoned. And, and he realizes that ultimately in life, there are no strings attached. Mm -hmm. 
And as soon as you make that, you're screwed. Well, I think that's also part of the drama, the great drama of being a parent, of having yeah, children, right. which is, that's of right. course, part of this, which is that you, not only do you have to, but in this amazing way, you actually do give things without strings attached. That's right. And, um, and one of the things that I say is if you sort of told the story of every single mother, suppose you told someone a story and you said, here's this play that I've written. It's a play about a woman who goes and finds this man on the street who's completely helpless, who can't talk, who can't take care of him, and she takes him into her household and she teaches him how to speak again, and she teaches him, she feeds him by hand until gradually he becomes strong enough, and she is completely devoted to him and utterly in love with him, and then after 15 years she says, why don't you go out and find a young woman to go off and live with 3,000 miles away in, you know, um, in another state? Well, you'd say, that's crazy. I mean, that's nuts. That couldn't be actually the story of anybody's life, but it's exactly the story of every <laughs> parent's life. Uh, and then sort of at the end of the day, if he kind of calls every couple of weeks and was sort of, you know, treated her with affectionate contempt, she'd think, oh, it's fantastic. You know, it's so wonderful to have a child who loves me as much as my child does. Yeah. So there's a sort of, there's this sort of deep asymmetry that's just built into the process yeah. about the relationship. Between, uh, between parents and children that has something intrinsically tragic in it, but also has something that is, that intrinsically means that you're giving up the sense of yourself and of the way that you shape yourself and your child and saying, what I'm going to do is support this child who's going to go off and create something that I can't possibly or can't imagine. And allow it to happen. I mean, I think with, in Leah's case, you know, <laughs> that, that, that he started it all by having those children. And that was his first responsibility, you know, and that was his first pact that he made by having the children. He has to understand that he's going to have these children and he has to have them in with, without. And of course, everybody makes these deals, you know, right. you know with, with, their, with their family. And that's where families, you know, the source of great tragedies lie in a lot of families. You know, and all these plays are full of that, really. Uh, but being able to give some of that up in the end is is what allows Lear to sort of envision what the future is. Well, it's, it's the, the liberating of, of that. I mean, that's what Prospero finds. Mm -hmm. Prospero finds that by liberating himself completely, he's free. You know, when he breaks his books, when he says, I'm not having any more of this, and I'm actually going back to nothing. And that's what, and that's, again, that's a late play. That's, uh, you know, that's the last great play, and it's what Shakespeare, I think, finally came to. I think he finally got fed up. He's, uh, you know, I mean, playing, when I played, the role of, I played Titus Andronicus, which is a great, great part, and it's a much more, in a way, much more um, childlike part. It's a yeah. real child's kind of role, and it's got a lot of, you know, it's a sort of, and it's written by a younger man, mm -hmm. and it's written by a man who isn't actually in a state of dejection. The Shakespeare of Titus Andronicus and the Shakespeare of King Lear are two different men. Mm. I mean, they're the same guy, but They've lived that, they've, you know, he's had a lot of rejection from his own family, so that's all in Leah. And then when he gets to, when he gets to Prospero, he realizes it's about letting go. It's about not having any bonds anymore, about saying, you know, when he breaks all his books, he says, that's it. I've done it. I break my staff. I, I disconnect myself to that sense of freedom, to that sense of nothingness. Although, of course, it's, you know, the amazing thing about Shakespeare is that all the way through, he has this ability to just escape into the voice of another person. That's which right. Is part of why it's so hard for us to, uh, it's right. so hard for us to actually find him. I was just reading this uh, fascinating book about all the, you know, people who believe in the non-Shakespeare oh, and yeah, Bacon and everything. You mean the guys who aren't Shakespeare. Right, the guys, the guys who, who yeah, aren't yeah, Shakespeare. Exactly, and yeah. it's an incredibly strange business. And, you know, we don't do that for any, anybody else, any of the other great writers. And part of it is because I think people feel as if, well, he's so elusive, right? He's well not I, there. I, there's I, Lear I, and there's Yeah, but, I, but if you know the plays, you know there are clear links in the plays. You know that, you know, when he wrote Titus Andronicus, he wrote part of Othello. He wrote ideas he... Ideas you see coming up in other plays, plays in like, uh, you know, uh, Hamlet, uh, Lear. I mean, they're all in the early plays. They're all early forms. They're all retelling of the same story. They really are, I mm -hmm. think. And actually, and, and, and it gets finer and it gets more sophisticated and, it get, and he gets 
and he gets to his point a little bit more. But it's the same. I think it's the same writer. I, I think the reason that we find it difficult to accept the idea of Shakespeare is because he is so extraordinary. I mean, I, being an autodidact, I cannot. I'm very against the idea of the fact that, you know, that he has to be written by a scholar. You know, yeah, you have right, to have the scholarly right. knowledge to write those plays. And I just say, well, what about the imagination? Why? What about the leap of faith? You know, what about all kinds of things that. You know, so I think the reason we have difficulty in accepting, and uh, some people, I, I believe he was a guy from Stratford-upon-Avon. Right, upon right exactly, yeah. That's what I believe. But there are people who don't believe that, and I, and I think it's to do with because of the extraordinariness, the extraordinariness of the work, and it's the work that makes us think not one man. It's like we've accepted that Mozart wrote what he wrote, right. and he wrote it. As a child as well, you know, he had that wonderful sense of freedom. In fact, I think he's probably the quintessential child of Mozart right. in terms of creation, what is possible, because all the, all the stuff was there. I think the same with Shakespeare, but I think it's kind of overwhelming for us. And I, but I think it's especially overwhelming because his, what his genius was about was exactly about sort of acting. I mean, in a sense, what he was doing when he was writing was acting. He oh was yeah. becoming Juliet. Or no, no, it was, it, was, it was all becoming about playing. Becoming his other self. It was all and, about playing. And I think that's something, well, this gets back to the question about, you know, does the actor, is the actor ever off stage, right? Is there a point at which the actor isn't? Well, the, the thing about the actor is, well, the thing about the I don't know what the thing about the actress, mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm saying, but the stuff you get, you, you gather information as you go on, and therefore it feeds you as an actor that you realize you learn things about life, which as a young person you can only imitate. Mm -hmm. Whereas then as you get older, you have experience of death, for example, when you, when the first, when you actually see the first person die. You then have that experience. Now it's there, it's usable. But it's not as invalid as the imaginatory experience. Mm -hmm. It's just that as you get older, you, 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 you try to find it away. You try, to, you try to make it more delicate, more particular. And certainly from my point of view, from what I feel about being an actor, is that, that I, I'm only interested in, in really what I now know, what I've learned that leads me to the other mystery. Right. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's the process of getting to the other mystery. But I think this is, again, like the case of science, where what happens is there's this funny irony. You can see it in, in Einstein, for example, where you'd think that the more you actually find out about the world, the more constrained your possibilities would be. And in fact, exactly the it's opposite, the opposite. That happens, right? It's the more the you opposite. actually find out and the more you know, it's the, the more your possibilities That's right. expand. So Einstein can... Uh, imagine possible ways that the world could be that no one had ever imagined before. Yeah. And that's not in spite of all the things that people had discovered about the physical world. That's because of all the things that Absolutely. people had discovered about the physical world. And it's what you take on board. I mean, it's, it's, it really does feed you. And it's, it's fantastic. I mean, I, I love it. I mean, I, I personally, you know, uh, I always look forward to the next role because I've just got new material, you know. <laughs> and in a sense, you know, what we do as scientists is the closer you are to the truth in terms of what you understand, the more powerful and coherent your counterfactuals, your possibilities can actually be. Yeah. Um, so again, that rather than seeing attention, so when you're, if you don't have a good, rich, deep understanding, say a good, rich, deep understanding of deep theory of the way some particular part of the world works, then it's much harder to imagine what the possible experiments would be. So as you get a richer, deeper understanding, and you can see this with children as well, as they develop, say, a causal understanding of how people work, the very first thing they do is translate that into, here's a new possibility. Here's yeah. a new way that I could think about. That's right. Uh, that here's a new way that I could think about people. That's the kind of miraculous element. That's the thing that keeps you going, actually. Well, we have, I've, I've done an experiment, going back to perspective taking, with uh, children just about the same age as Theo. Um, where we wanted to see what would happen as children started to understand more about the varieties of people, the way that different people could be. And we wanted to do it with these little children, so instead of asking them, what we did was we actually gave them bowls of food. So we gave them a bowl of raw broccoli and a bowl of Pepperidge Farm Goldfish crackers. And all the kids, even in Berkeley, liked the crackers rather than the uh, broccoli. But then we showed them another person, and the other person actually acted as if they liked the broccoli, they went, mmm, they did a little performance, mmm, broccoli, and mmm, yuck, crackers. And then they put out their hands to the child and said, can you give me some? 
And first of all, what we discovered was the 18-month-olds would give them crackers if they like cracker, but broccoli if they like broccoli. So it was as if this little performance had persuaded the children, oh, okay, well, this is Titus Andronicus, but, and here's the way he works. Here's someone <laughs> who has this, you know, totally bizarre, strange <laughs> broccoli lover, right? You know, as sort of like as strange as seeing one of these, you know, David Mamet villains where you'd say, what, how does he work? And the children had figured out, oh, here's what the next scene should be. If this is the broccoli lover, I'll give them broccoli. Um, but the 14-month-olds hadn't done that yet. So the 14-month-olds would look for a long time. They couldn't figure it out, but they couldn't figure out what the next part of the scene would be. So they would just give you crackers, even if you acted as if you really liked broccoli. So somehow, in the children's experience between 14 months and 18 months, and we think especially their experience of the sort of terrible twos, where there's a conflict yeah. between you and someone else, they had learned something very profound about people, in namely that, yeah, namely that, I could want one thing and you could want another thing. And that let them imagine and envision this possibility. Here's a broccoli lover, as strange as that might seem. Um, and when someone acted as a broccoli lover, the children could figure out what the next scene should be. Wow. They could figure out what the, what wow. the next part of the process would be. Wow. Um, and I think that's what you see in the children's pretend, uh, in the children's pretending as well. And there's some evidence that when children, children who pretend a lot, who have imaginary friends, are making these uh, progressions to this more detailed, rich sense of human possibilities, even if it takes the form of just people could like broccoli, more quickly than the children who aren't doing as much of that pretend play. And again, I think that's part of what acting does for us as a, not just for the actors, but for us as the audience, as the people who are going to, say, see Shakespeare, is that we have a sense of, here's the diversity of possibility of what the way that human beings could be. The choices. Um, I had a friend who was a, a musician, and she told a wonderful story about, I think it was uh, her teacher who I th was a famous pianist. I think it was actually Grendel. And she came in and she said, look, I'm 18 years old. I'm playing this music by Beethoven. I can't possibly have any of the emotions that are going on in this music. And he said, well, play the music, and that will give you the emotions, and then you'll that's right. I, I understand and appreciate That's and recognize right. those emotions when you go out in the Well, world. you know, I mean, I, when I, I, I played, you know, when I, before I was 21, I played, I played Pier Gint, I played <laughs> Iago, I played Mercutio, I played <laughs> Bolingbroke, I played, uh, I played uh, Orlando. And these are parts that were way beyond my means, but I, by playing them, and it's something that doesn't happen anymore, you know, I, it was like my apprenticeship. Yeah. It's what I learned and by playing. Of course, you know, the great thing about Shakespeare is, is that in when you understand the sophistication of the verse in Shakespeare, the verse is what supports you. The yeah. actual fact that you've got rhythm, you've got m that the rhythm is the sense. Coleridge talks about that. Coleridge is the best guy in that, the, the poet Coleridge. Is that really that, that, that a passionate or a poet, poet Coleridge talks about, he, he uses a thing called hexameters, and he's, there's this heartbreaking letter that he wrote, he wrote to Wordsworth and Dorothy Wordsworth, he, was, he became estranged from. And he wrote it in the form of a hexameter. And it's extremely painful because it's da dum 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 And it's almost like a kind of twitch. But there's, and, and it goes, dear William and dear Dorothea, and da And you, you realize this kind of state that's in the rhythm of the poet. And that, just doing it, you get the sense of right. it. Right. And this is why, you know, imitation is what's very important. That's why when Theo does, you know, that is right. the question. You know, and it, it really means, and then he does a wonderful thing when he does arrows. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and these arrows are these kind of crazy arrows going all this way. But that's his invention. You see, he just took the ball and ran with it, you know. And well, and we know, one of the things that we know that even, I mean, again, what the very... One of the very, very first things that we see infants do in an incredibly sophisticated and intelligent way, within the first month or so after a baby's born, they start to be able to do uh, what, well, psychologists call it fancy things like interactional synchrony, but it's really sort of flirting, where they watch what mom does and they see, you know, mom says, oh, you're such a sweet boy, aren't you? Um, and the baby's going, oh, ha, 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 ha. And it turns out that if 
you do a careful analysis of videotapes, say, of the child in those circumstances, they're performing the, genuinely performing this kind of rhythmic dance with the caregiver, with the adult, where they're picking up on the rhythm, they're picking up on the sound, oh, yeah. they're bringing, they're taking turns, they're putting in that ah, 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 before there's actually any, before there's actually any content at all. So yeah. that ability to just say, here's the sound of a voice, here's the rhythm of a voice, here's the here's a gesture, and to be able to to dance to that other person's rhythm. That's one of the most intelligent, sophisticated things that babies do pretty much before they can do anything I, else. I've always, it's always amazed me, uh, we should get into questions from the yeah. audience, but it's just one thing that's always amazed me about the whole business of bringing up children is the, is the nanny philosophy. Because what is so extraordinary about the nannies is they have first-hand uh, experience of that, because the one thing you copy is the nanny. You know, you talk, you know, I've talked to people that, who were brought up by their ayahs in India, or mm -hmm. the, the, the similar in South Africa, by their, the, the, the white kids who were brought up by the black, you know, their, their African uh, nannies. And, and, and you realize that that's, that power that you've given to that person is so astonishing in, in terms of the formi formation of that child's life. And one never really begins to understand that. You know, what, what we, we take it for granted because we just want to get sent. We don't realize what, what exactly that kind of relationship that you just talked about, how that imitative thing that comes from the nanny, that we, I'd never had a nanny, but I can, I've seen nannies at work, that that's how it, that's very much the basis of their relationship there. And it's almost a secret compact that they have mm -hmm. together, is that time, that kind of collusion that they have, which is very hard to break. Of course, it's also been the stuff of great drama <laughs> as well. You know. Well, I think part of what it, it is difficult for lots of people who are parents nowadays is, I mean, being a parent is a kind of role that you have to rehearse. And I think in the other right. times past, when, for instance, you had an enormous family and you had, you had all sorts of younger brothers and sisters and, and cousins, and you can actually hear, you know, three-year-olds, when they're talking to a two-year-old, will start putting on a mother That's voice right. and saying, oh, you know, aren't you? A sweet baby, and they'll turn very condescendingly to, you know, you yeah. to explain that they're just a baby. And I think a lot of us, a lot of people nowadays, don't get a chance to really rehearse the role of being. I, I think that or my, my my father died when I was eight, and I I I find it very hard to, because my father was mythic, right. and I find it hard to really. Uh, I've always found it with younger children. I'm good but when they're getting older. I'm good, but I'm, it's very difficult for younger children to me because I. I I don't quite know where I'm supposed to fit in with that. It's a, it's a tough one. Um, why don't we open up the floor? This is a good point, thinking about interactions and, uh, Absolutely. and roles. Why don't we open up the floor to some uh, Yeah, OK, so we'll, we've got microphones on either side of the house, and we'll um, take uh, questions in order as, as long as we've got time for them. And I see a question right there. Hold up your hand. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. And anybody else who wants to be the second? Yes, ma'am. OK, go for it. Yes, Brian, thank you for sharing your art with us, uh, both theater and film. I wondered if you write and do you create characters in your head, especially when you're thinking about nothing? Uh, <laughs> I, I suppose I do to a certain extent. Um, I, I, I find the struggle with my own character actually is, is the one that is the biggest, the biggest challenge for me. <laughs> is knowing what this character <laughs> is. And this is the one that, you know, the other characters are easy. It's this one that I have the one difficult, is, is the one I have the difficulty with. So I haven't really got time to write other characters because I'm still sort of working on this one. You know, um, that's why sometimes, you know, play for me is almost, uh, there's a relief in it too. Because, you know, my, my own complex structure, I just, I'm only beginning to understand, you know, now and uh, it's taking me, but it's like I'm at the foothills of the Himalayas, you know, it's like a huge <laughs> thing, you know. And, uh, and, and I think, I, I, think we're, I, I don't think I'm alone. I think we spend most of our lives avoiding ourselves, you know, or just trying to live with ourselves and say, well, you know, this is my habit. It's my habit, but then you go, maybe after the age of 40, you say, well, it's not really a very good habit. Then by the age of 60, you're saying, this is a really bad <laughs> habit. You know, I've really got to do something about this habit. And then, you know, <laughs> you know and so, and I, I think that that's the work that you do, you know. And, you know, the theater helps. It kind of mirrors certain things, as 
Shakespeare says you hold the mirror up to nature. So in that way, it, it, it is an enormous help. But um, writing, I tend to, if I write something, and I have written two books, I tend to write nonfiction. The characters are already there. The characters I've observed. I wrote a book about Russia uh, when I taught at the Moscow Arts for a year and working in the Soviet system. So I wrote about a lot of characters there. And then I wrote a, 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 a Lear diary, which I did when I played Lear. So it was about playing Lear in different countries and the effect that it had on the people that I met through that. So my tendency, and I, I've always enjoyed fiction, it's a bit like Halloween, I think. Uh, I, you'll never find an actor dressing up for Halloween. <laughs> you know, so in a sense, I wouldn't be wanting to be writing about other characters. You know, so busy. Maybe eventually, but you know, not, not, not in the future, not now. Yes, I was wondering, uh, so much depends on where you're born, who you're born to, and how open or closed the culture is. I mean, there are still, in terms of, child development and what they're allowed and what the culture allows. And both as children and adults, it makes a big difference about how ritualized or how rigid your culture is. Uh, and that affects you as a child and what you become or are allowed to become. And certainly, in this day and age, there's many more options for some of us, not you know in the world, not everybody. And how does that affect you know children and as you become an adult, what you're allowed to do and allowed to imagine for yourself? Right. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question. One thing about uh, the kind of pretend play and imaginary companions, for instance, is that different cultures are very different in terms of how much they encourage or discourage, say, children having a, a imaginary friends. There are some cultures that uh, find it quite terrifying to think about uh, uh, children having imaginary friends. Think of them as being sort of taken over by past lives, for example, or um, uh, so that varies, but on the other hand, as far as you could tell, in all of these cultures, children end up do do end up exploring uh, imaginary companions and imaginary friends. So the children seem to be very driven to it, and what the culture can do is give them the models for what kinds of imaginary friends they're going to have or not. Um, my uh, niece, who grew up, who, who's grown up close to here in uh, Manhattan, had an imaginary friend who was too busy to play with her. Um, <laughs> So she would leave messages on the imaginary friend's uh, answering machine, and, wow. you know. Um, now, I don't think that in California, uh, children would have imaginary friends like that. Um, so there's things about the way that that's culture, culture <laughs> shapes uh, That's truly, shapes that's an extraordinary concept. Lives. But I do think it's, you know, one of the things that I think is interesting is that England, which after all, in some ways, you would think of as being uh, a relatively rigid, conservative country has been the place of great acting. And I've always, I lived in England, I did my PhD in Oxford, and I always thought it was exactly because trying to negotiate all of these very carefully defined roles in everyday life in England meant that people became very sensitive and good at figuring out. Well, it's, uh, well I think a lot of that is also to do with, I mean, uh, it doesn't always apply, but l England, of the Great Britain, I'm Scots, uh, so <laughs> I'm not English. <laughs> but uh, I did live, I have lo lived in England a long time. Uh, it's, it's very feudal. Yeah. So it's everybody in their place. And so therefore you, you, I mean, it was very funny. When I came to America for the first time, people all thought I was English. Mm -hmm. So I used to pretend to be English. <laughs> and I would pretend, I realized, oh, it's rather nice, I get accepted as English here. <laughs> Whereas in England, I right. was never accepted as English. You know, I was, well, he's a Scot. I mean, he's clearly not English. And therefore, also, there's a certain, and one of the reasons I also came to America was because of the egalitarian notion of roles, that you could be anything. Mm -hmm. Whereas in England, or uh, the UK, you could, uh, you, if you're a non-commissioned officer, you're a non-commissioned officer. Right. It's very hard to play an officer because the structure, and, and Shakespeare is full of that, I mean, yeah. in a way. And it's one of the problems I have with Shakespeare is he's so feudal in many ways. Mm -hmm. You know, though I can, I can play, well, <laughs> it's so funny, I can play a king in England, but I could never play a lord in a television series in the UK, but I ah. could play a king on stage, which is a really interesting kind of thing. You know, it's kind of, it's, it's kind of curious in a way, but it's true. I mean, uh, you know, I've played major classical roles, but in, but in terms of, it, only Woody Allen, an American, cast me as an upper-class Englishman. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
So we've got a question here first, and then we'll come to over there. Yeah, hi. Um, Brian, you mentioned the difference between little girls and, and little boys in the box of nothing, and uh, obviously both of you think that a lot of you know, who we are is learned, and a lot of it is intrinsic. And I was wondering, Alison, if, if you've done any study on or have an opinion on whether the sexuality right. and gender is something that's learned, or, or is it something that we're born with? Right. Well, I mean, one of the things that we know is, in, in a way, it isn't even something that we're born with physically, because we know that there's already a very long series of interactions in, in the womb that actually make us very uh, elaborate interactions between our ge genetics and our hormones that actually make us have the characteristics that we, that we do. Um, and I think the general principle that comes out of psychology is that we are always seeing these very complicated interactions between individual temperament and the roles that we get. Again, like a rehearsal, right? So it's, it, it's not that you would say, well, look, I could tell you what kind of lair you, know, you were going to have in, uh, at the beginning of the performance. It's through this interaction between the temperament that you bring to the part and then what other people bring that that ends up being the performance. And, and I think actually gender roles are actually quite a nice example of that, where for instance, we know that literally from the time babies are born, you, and you dress up a baby and tell people this is a girl or a boy, and they'll interact differently mm. with that baby, with a one month old, depending on that. So the babies are already getting different information. But one thing that is interesting is on this whole dimension of understanding other people's mind. We psychologists call it theory of mind sometimes, and that's like the broccoli and the uh, crackers experiment. Um, everybody always expected that it was going to turn out that girls were better at that than boys. And we've never found any sex differences. But a colleague of mine has found a very interesting difference, which is if you ask married couples and you say, who understands more about what's going on in the other person's mind, the husbands say that the wife does, and the wife says that the wife does. So <laughs> both the husbands and the wives think that. And you actually go out and do a test, it turns out they're completely equal. So Women and men seem to think that women are better at understanding what's going on in now people's minds. Now, why is that? But, um, <laughs> Do we know why? It's the kind of meta roles about you know what what your role is and what you think your role is. An interesting case there where there is an individual difference though is sibling position. So actually, you get more interesting differences between older siblings and younger siblings. And in this case, the younger siblings are actually the ones who I think are who we can show our understand more about other people than the older siblings do. So being a younger sibling seems to be a very good context to figure out what's going on in other people's heads. And I wouldn't be surprised to find that there's a lot of younger siblings who are actors as well. I'm the youngest but of five. Ah, okay. So there's yeah. a great example. And I, of course, as the scientist, am the oldest of six. But, um, <laughs> but I, think, I think there is something about the way that you know, Napoleon evidently said that the valet always knows more about his master than the master does about the valet. And I think being a younger sibling is a bit like yeah. that, right? Yeah. You have to sort of figure out how all these people well are. We have to figure out this family dynamic. Yeah. You know, it's a, yeah. Uh, we have a question over here, but we also have a hand up there, this gentleman with the beard. So if we get the mic to there. OK, go for it. Hi. Um, I don't understand children at all, but um, <laughs> and I have several. <laughs> Um, talking about roles, uh, to cross-pollinate between the two of you, Brian, was there ever a role that you did that you couldn't shake? And what happens in child psychology when a child takes on a role that is antithetical to um, his natural state of affairs, so to speak? No, I, I can't honestly say there was ever, ever a role that I couldn't shake. Um, I mean, there are roles that have kind of laid that have sat with me. And there are roles of, that I've really, uh, I've found repellent, uh, certain characters that I've, I really did not like, you know, I inhabited them, but I really did not like wearing them. There was a character I played, Rob Roy, who was probably one of the most repellent individuals I'd ever played in my life. I mean, he was just, he was a voyeur, and he was, he was just a, a awful, awful man. Um, but on the whole, I've never really, I don't, I, the, you know, it's a, uh, upward and onward, you know. Well, I think one of the things that we know with children in, uh, is that there's this enormous resilience, but it's a resilience that has certain kinds of limits. So one of the things, one of the, one of the areas that people have looked at is 
what children think about love, for example, and psychologists <coughs> talk about this in terms of attachment. And we know that children get cues about what love is like from the close relationships that they have early on. But the rather striking thing is that children can revise those. So one of the really nice examples of this is the Romanian orphans. Um, so these were children who were not taken care of by anyone in a consistent way. And the children developed a way of interacting with people that kind of fit that picture. So they would be affectionate, but then they would move back and forth from being affectionate one moment to being aggressive the next. They were sort of promiscuously affectionate to everybody that they met, three and four-year-olds, when they were adopted. But once they got adopted, and once they actually were getting information that said, here's another possibility, then they seemed to be able to recover. Um, and one of the things that when people look at resilience, why is it that children who grow up in terrible circumstances don't actually become terrible themselves, and most children don't? Um, it turns out that very often it's just one person who was out there, a teacher or a cousin, who sort of had this sense of possibility. The world could be different from this. this you could be different from this. And again, I think that's one of the things that fiction and theater give us. I, 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 I think that's very true. I mean, I think that, that, that in my life, certainly in my early life, which was pretty bleak, there were just one, two teachers, eventually, initially not at all, for the first for 11 years of my life, it was really pretty not very good at all. But there were two teachers that, that actually saved me, yeah. that, that set me in the right direction. And I hadn't realized it. In fact, I was, I'm writing a commencement speech at the moment, and I just suddenly realized about these two men. And they, they weren't even teachers who taught me. They just actually gave me a right. some, so they held up some kind of image for me that, that I saw, ah, you know, it's not all bad. <laughs> yeah, that you could actually have that picture. One of the things that I love is when you read 19th century fiction, 19th century literature, the Arabian Nights in English. So you read Carlyle's biography, and yeah. this is the most god-awful, ga you know, the most Puritan, Calvinist, Scottish yeah, life yeah, yeah, with yeah. nothing, you know, no possibility of light. And he read the Arabian Nights, and the Arabian Nights were the way that he could imagine warmth and light and color and sex and everything else that was good in life came from this. Also, we, you know, you, you were talking about in the, in the English culture. One of the great things, of course, is how we have contributed to children's culture. Yeah. Particularly through, uh, if you think of uh, Dodson, if you think of Lewis Carroll. You know, and Lewis Carroll and all those poets of that area, you know, and writers, they, Victorians, they really kind of, uh, they, had this, they had a real understanding of the child in a way, which was quite unique. And the sense of, po and again, that sense of possibility. It's funny that, you know, given that children depend on security and stability, we were talking about anarchy and order. That's they right. depend on order so much. But when they want to read about books, they want to read about children who go off on adventures. That's right. Get rid of those damn parents. And, uh, let's follow through a rabbit hole. Yes, y your question. Hi. Um, Brian, I was wondering if you could talk, and I think this was mentioned a little bit in the description of, of what today would be, um, but about your experience or your your process in terms of approaching a role and negotiating self, um, dealing with whether it's yourself and how you approach a different self, if there's a consistent way or maybe just some of your experiences in that. I think it really does, I, I, I think the principle is, the principle I, I really am, coming more and more to adhere to, which is the principle of, of Theo, uh, is the freedom from any, it, it's very hard because there is so much conditioning that one has to fight. And the older you are, the more conditioning you have to fight uh, in terms of, you know, received notions of what people are or what people be. Mm. And my thing is endlessly that the human being is a mystery and he's, it's a mysterious animal, but it is an animal that is impregnated upon with all kinds of ideas and impressions. And certainly, philosophically speaking, and also kind of spiritually speaking, it's something that I, 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 really, I really do believe in. I really do believe that you, you really start with a blank page, and you have to make the page as blank as you can. Now, you take, you know, I, I'm not averse to the Dantonist idea of you, you do what does you good, so you take what serves you and what's going to allow you to kind of make bridge, you know, bridges for towards characters. But it's, it's a, a process whereby you don't necessarily, that's not necessarily what the playing is about. 
the plane can be something that's liberated from that. Mm -hmm. That's just like a crutch. It's like a, it's like a pro it's, it is a process. But uh, my, my feeling, and I mean, I don't want to get too kind of shamanistic or mystical about it, but I do think that there's, there's, a, there's a thing that happens with actors, that they are, they are receivers and transmitters, that things are going, energy is going through them. And they have to do, it behooves them not to interfere with that energy, to keep that energy quite pure, to keep it quite, you know, to allow the, it's, it's, it's uh, well, the, big, the, the easiest example is in mask work. A lot of actors, when they put on a mask and they look in the mirror, they immediately go, oh, I see, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this. And they start striking a series of poses. Well, really in mask work, it's much more savagery. You put on the mask and something happens, something that you're not necessarily in control of, so that you have to ride it, and you have to have, that, you have, to have the experience and the trust to allow to take you on a kind of helter-skelter, roller, roller coasting type journey, and you're picking up stuff along the way, and then you take off the mask and you let it go. Now, that's a sort of speeded up process, if you like, but it's... It's really what I believe. I don't believe that you should, you know, uh, the head um, is good, but it's also a tyranny. You know, uh, the thinking is a tyranny. Uh, there's something else at play. And, of course, there's opinion. Of course, there's all kinds of stuff. But you it's a kind of filtering process, you know. It's not being locked into any one idea or one notion that that will help you. It, it's, 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 it's really being open, as open as you can be. And I think that's what separates, to me that's what, I, I mean one of the problems I have when watching young actors these days is I see them on screen and they're constantly playing the effect of the role rather than the role. They're constantly playing what the, what the next job will be where it's going to lead them in their career path. And I'm constantly seeing actors endlessly who are not present on screen. Now, they seem to be present, and they're kind of, there's a, a facility of that, but they're actually not. They're actually playing every other motive except doing the job, doing what the, pretending, being, you know, what that child does in the moment. That child has no ax to grind. That child has no career motive. That child isn't looking towards anything. It's purely doing what it's supposed to be doing at that particular time and does it with the grace and the humor and the wit and the smartness that's so inherent there. And that's what I feel that we should always try to get back to as actors. I, and I think that we're acting is in, for me, acting is in a very powerless state because it doesn't work. There's not a lot of good acting around. Because people act from the wrong point of view. So they're, they're exploiting instead of exploiting. They're exploiting. They're exploiting their position. Celebrity has a lot to do with it, you know. And constantly I'm saying, please send that actor to drama school. <laughs> it's time he went to drama school. We've seen enough of his work. He's earned, you know, that amount of money. Somebody now take him to drama school and teach him how to act <laughs> or teach her how to act. Alison, just to round out that point, um, and we didn't expand on that very much, but um, Alison should know, um, studied philosophy before she became um, um, a psychologist. And uh, you mentioned Humean notions yeah. of no yeah. self. Absolutely. Can you expand on that a little bit and yeah, give an yeah. a counterpoint what Brian Absolutely. said? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so actually, I, I'm still half in the psychology department at Berkeley, and I'm an affiliate in the philosophy department, and I started out and continue to be a philosopher, and the reason for, s for my doing the scientific work I do is just because, as opposed to just the philosophers who ask the questions, I thought you could actually answer them. <laughs> and <laughs> and one, of the, one of the, exactly one of the big philosophical questions is this question about the self, about, about whether there actually is a self or not. And, and as I say, there's this wonderful moment in the history of philosophy where Descartes has gotten rid of all of your understanding about the external world. He's willing to be skeptical about that, but he says, no, the groundwork, the thing that absolutely has to be there is your sense of self. And Hume comes in and really for the first time in Western philosophy says, um, 
well, wait a minute. And he has this beautiful passage where he says, you know, I look inside of my head and I see thoughts and desires and perceptions, but I never see this person, this self who I right. keep hearing about. You know, where, where is that? What I actually see when I look in my head is, is a whole bunch of different ideas. Um, but this self, this person, just doesn't seem to be there. And actually, I ended up t I've ended up doing a sort of his historical uh, enterprise where it turns out that at the time that Hume was writing his treatise, he was actually in a Jesuit college, and some of the Jesuits who had been who were there had been missionaries in Tibet and in uh, Siam, and had spent time with Buddhist philosophy. One of one of them actually wrote a manuscript that was repressed, of course, by the Vatican, but that actually gave a whole outline of Buddhist philosophy. So it's at least possible that the same idea, which you see, you know, you see it in the uh, Buddhist texts about uh, the chariot, you know, that mm. is, is the, 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 there's this famous uh, uh, dialogue between Nagasena and the king, and, and the king says, Nagasena, I understand that you say that you have no self, that's crazy, and Nagasena says, well, you know, how could, he says, how could you have no self, and he says, well, di did you come in a chariot, you know, when you came, when you came here, and the king said, yeah, says yes, and he says, well, where's the chariot? Is it the wheels? And the king says, no, it's not the wheels. And he says, well, is it the, you know, is it the handle? Is it the wood? And he says, no, that's not the chariot. And he says, well, it's the same way. I'm Nagasena. Here's my ideas, and here's my thoughts, and here's my body. But there isn't anything beyond that, just right. like there's no chariot beyond the, chariot. the wheels. And I think, again, that's one of the, one of the, that's very much what Hume argued. And, and Hume also argues that this is liberating in mm. the same way that the Buddhist tradition argues that this is sure. liberating. Because it isn't that what happens is that then the self disappears, that you're sort of caught in this nihilistic mm. nothingness, that what happens is that it grows into this uh, sense of possibility, which again, I think is part of what yeah, the actor's discovery uh, uh, Absolutely, of that, I, I think, well, Hume was a Scotsman, as you know. Yes, indeed, <laughs> indeed. <laughs> and made a great point about not wanting to be the way that, not wanting to be in the narrow roles that the English were always no, trying absolutely. to force him absolutely. into. But he was also at the time of Adam Smith, and Adam Smith was very much, they were very much... Oh, and, and, and another really interesting point about this from actors, which you mentioned Adam Smith as well, is that Hume also thought that the way that you understood other people, you couldn't do Descartes' process of just looking in your head and seeing this self. The way you understood other people was through what Hume called sentiment, which was emotion. So he thought that the way that you understood yourself and others was through your voice and your movements and sentiment and emotion weren't just sort of this, you know, decoration there to amuse women on top of the wonderful, wonderful self that was the rational self, but that that was actually the way that you created the self, that the, the thing that human beings were created out That's of right. was, was sentiment and emotion and feeling and not just not just ra reason, not just a bunch of propositions that you believe, which I think is also a message that you get, uh, that you get 